Hi, this is Dr. Ben Finio. I am a lecturer at Cornell University, and in this video, we will talk about the basics of using Zoom to teach an online class. Now, I already have two other videos on using Zoom as a student and on how to prevent Zoom bombing, so we won't be going over those aspects of it in this video. Here, we'll mainly be focusing on using the meeting controls as a host. And I am joined today, as you can see, by Elmo, Abby, and Cookie Monster. Mr. Moose was not able to make it because my daughter got mad that I kept stealing him for Zoom meetings. Now, let's back up a bit to the very beginning of the meeting. In this meeting, I have the waiting room feature enabled. This feature allows your students to click the link to join your meeting, but then it keeps them in a virtual waiting room where they can't see or hear you until you click another button to admit them to the meeting. So this can give you a little extra space to make sure your presentation's ready, get your camera and microphone working and everything. You can access the meeting room by clicking on the Manage Participants button at the bottom. You will see that two people are waiting in the meeting room. You can either admit them individually or just hit the Admit All button to admit all of your students. Once you admit them, you'll then see their thumbnails show up in the meeting window. So again, you might want to do this part while your students are still in the waiting room, but just in case you don't have that feature enabled, the first thing you probably want to do is make sure your students can see and hear you. Now, it's a little easier to tell if they can see you because you can see your own thumbnail on your screen. It might be harder to tell if they can hear you because you can't hear what's happening on their end. So make sure you go down to the lower left, and if your computer is detecting your audio, you should see this little green bar bouncing up and down. That's the signal going to my microphone. If not, hit the up arrow next to it and make sure you have the correct microphone selected. So if you're just on a laptop with a built-in camera and built-in microphone, this isn't much of an issue. But if you're using a computer with an external microphone or there's multiple possible um, sound sources, you want to make sure you have the correct microphone and the correct speakers selected here. For example, if you're using a headset and external speakers, you want to make sure the sound is coming out of the right one so you can hear your students. And... If you can't figure it out or you're having trouble, there's this test speaker and microphone option where you can click that and I don't know if you can hear that in the background. Zoom will play a ringtone and ask if you can hear that to confirm that your speakers are working. working. Then it will ask you to speak and pause. Then it will ask you to speak and pause. And play the sound back at you so you can confirm that your microphone is working as well. That will help you identify if there is an audio problem on your end or if one of your students is having a problem, for example, their microphone isn't working. That lets you differentiate whether the problem is their microphone or your speakers. Similarly, you can hit the up arrow next to stop video. Just in case you do have multiple webcams connected, this will select, let you select the one you're using. You can also choose your virtual background. This is something a lot of people have been having fun with since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you are suddenly stuck working from home in your bedroom and you don't want people to see your piles of dirty laundry or your unmade bed, you can select a picture that Zoom will then automatically put behind your head to block what's in the background. Okay, now let's start to talk about some of the meeting controls that you have as a host. First, and not in any particular order here, you have the chat window. You can click on the chat button at the bottom to open this. This is a good way to communicate with your students, especially if you're still having audio problems at the beginning and you can't hear them or they can't hear you. You could type, hello everyone, can you hear me? Or something like that. And then people will be able to respond to you via text as opposed to trying to talk if their microphones or your speakers aren't working. You can control this as the host. So the default is that everyone can talk to everyone and your messages are broadcast to everyone, but you can also select individual participants to send a private message to, and you can control who students can talk to. So if you click the little three dots in the lower right here, again, the default is everyone can send messages to everyone else and send private messages to others, but you could turn that off so they can only send public messages to everyone, they can only send messages to you, or they can't chat to anybody. So as the host, you can control the chat functionality for the participants. Now, unless you are teaching a very small class, the chat window is probably not a great way to communicate, and especially for students to ask questions, because as people talk over each other, the chat will fill up and the questions will just scroll off the top of the screen and you'll miss them. A much better way to do that is the nonverbal feedback feature available in the Manage Participants window. So we've already seen this window once when we dealt with the waiting room. If you click on that, you'll notice you have a series of icons across the bottom like yes and no, and if you click those, a little icon will appear next to your name in the participant list. You don't have it as the host, but your participants also have a raise hand button. 
So for example, Elmo has clicked his raise hand button to get my attention. I now have a hand icon in his thumbnail and next to his name in the participants list. As the host, this then gives me options to unmute him or lower the hand and I can address his question. So that is a much better way to get my attention than trying to use the chat. While we're here, there are a couple other useful controls in the Manage Participants window. You have a Mute All button. So depending on your default settings, your students may be muted when they join, but if they unmute themselves to ask a question and then forget to remute, this can get annoying and it kind of only takes one person to spoil the audio if they have bad background noise. So you can click Mute All to forcibly mute all of the meeting participants. And then if you really want to, you can uncheck this box that says allow participants to unmute themselves. And now people will not be able to unmute themselves. You or a co-host will have to do it. And speaking of co-hosts, um, you'll probably see this feature more if, for example, you're teaching a university class and you have a TA who's calling into the lecture with you. You can mouse over any individual meeting participant, click on more, and click make co-host. So this will give them many of the same permissions that you have in terms of helping to manage the chat and manage hand raising and the nonverbal feedback in this participant's window. Okay, now that we've talked about some of the controls and the participant and chat window, let's talk about what you're actually seeing in the main part of the Zoom window here. So by default, when everybody is the same size like this, this is called gallery view. If you want one video to be larger than the others, you can go up here in the upper right and click on speaker view. But you can see by default, that won't necessarily make your video the biggest. So if you want to control what you are seeing in the larger part, you can right click on any individual thumbnail and select pin video, but that does not necessarily do that for your students. So any individual meeting participant can choose which video they want to pin. If you want to make sure you are highlighting your video for all the students, you need to right click yourself and click spotlight video. You'll get a note that says the host has spotlighted your video for everyone, and that will then show your video bigger for all the students. But each individual participant can then manually toggle back to gallery view if they want to. So what you see here is not necessarily exactly what your students see. They do maintain some individual control over the view on their end. And for example, if you have a student who's speaking to the rest of the class, you can also spotlight their video by right clicking on someone, click spotlight video, and then that will spotlight the student's video for the rest of the class, which can be useful, for example, if you're doing student presentations. Okay, next we're going to talk about screen sharing because there's a good chance that as an instructor you will be sharing some sort of content from your screen or from the room you're in. So you can do that by clicking on the share screen button at the bottom and you will get a bunch of options so it doesn't just automatically share everything that's on your monitor. You can also select individual windows on your computer and there are a couple different options we'll talk about later. So first let's just say I have a PowerPoint I want to share but I don't want to accidentally share other windows on my monitor. So you can just click on that PowerPoint file, click share, and then you have to be careful because you'll notice your Zoom controls will change somewhat drastically when you do that. So your Zoom view immediately goes to full screen. My chat and my participants window disappeared and my little gallery view is now in this floating window that I can drag around. So if I want that out of my way, I can collapse it then you just kind of have to be careful not to lose track of it because this gets very tiny. Your controls also collapsed into a hidden toolbar up at the top. So this is no longer at the bottom of the screen, it's way up here, and you have to mouse over and then you get a bunch of these controls back like your mute and video controls and your manage participants. Some of them may have collapsed under more over here. For example, I have to click on more to go down to chat. And if I open that, it is now again in a floating window then drag around so it's not docked over on the side since I'm in this full screen view. Same thing goes for manage participants. So this can be kind of annoying if you are on a single monitor because it is difficult to have all of this stuff open at once without covering up the content you're sharing. If you're on two monitors it's a little easier because I can drag all of these windows over to my other monitor so they're out of the way so you can't see that since I'm only recording on one monitor but I have dragged them all over to my second monitor so now I can still have all of those open and I can see my PowerPoint here. Next if you are on two monitors or connected to a projector or something you have to be a little careful when sharing your PowerPoint to make sure your students see the proper screen so when I hit slideshow 
Zoom is sharing this screen. This is the presenter view. What I want my students to see is the actual presentation. So you can do that by going up to display settings and click swap presenter view and slideshow. And now my actual presentation is on the monitor that Zoom is sharing. So if you had a PowerPoint with multiple slides, you could just click through and your students would see it here. So that covers sharing a PowerPoint file or another program on your computer, but what about writing? This is something that many teachers do on a chalkboard or a whiteboard in a real physical classroom. How could you do this on your computer? So one of the simplest options, there are a couple different ways to do it, but you can just use Zoom's built-in whiteboard feature by clicking share screen and then clicking on whiteboard and click share. This will bring up a basic whiteboard environment with controls similar to a basic drawing program like Microsoft Paint, where you have a marker you can select with different thicknesses, you can change the color, that sort of thing. So this works if you just kind of need to draw something simple. It's not as full featured as a third party program like Notability or OneNote or PowerPoint, and you need to save each image manually. So there's a save button here that will save what's currently on the screen. But then if you want to add a new slide or a new page, you have to clear this one, draw something new, and save it again. So if your goal is to generate a PDF or a presentation where you can export the whole thing at the end and scroll through it, again, this doesn't really have the same functionality as some of those other programs, which we'll talk about next. There is also a minor security concern here. You have to check your settings to see whether annotations are enabled for your students, which would allow them to draw on your slides as well. So if you're worried about inappropriate behavior or graffiti, you need to check that. And again, I addressed that separately in the Zoom bombing video, so we're not gonna talk about that here. Now, if you do have a device like an iPad or a two-in-one laptop, you can also log into Zoom on that and draw on it with a stylus, which can make writing a little easier. So you can see here, I actually have borrowed Elmo's computer and I'm using it in tablet mode and I have my stylus. So when I write on this, Elmo is screen sharing from this machine and that appears on the screen share on my desktop computer, which is what's being recorded. So again, my handwriting is just a little ni nicer now because I'm drawing with the stylus as opposed to using my computer mouse. Now, this can be a little difficult to do from home yourself if you only have the one computer or laptop. For example, if I was only logged in on this laptop, Again, because when this goes full screen in screen sharing, all those other windows collapse, so my chat window and participants window are gone now, and if I open those, they would be covering what I'm sharing on the screen. So if you have two computers, for example, in my case, I'm logged in to the main Zoom window as the host on my desktop, where I can easily access these chat and participant windows, and then I am using this one separately for the writing. That can make life a lot easier. Or if you're teaching a university class and you have a TA who can log in on a separate machine to manage the chat, that does make life easier than trying to do everything from a single tablet or touchscreen computer that can get a little difficult. Now, there are some lower tech options here if you don't have a tablet. One is to use an external webcam as a document camera. So I can take my webcam on the top of my monitor here and I would have to build something or kind of rig something to aim this downward at a piece of paper and then I can just write on the paper and that's what the students will see. And you might say, wait a minute, that is backwards. So this would not be backwards for your students, but Zoom by default mirrors it for you. That way when you are looking at the camera, it feels like you're looking into a mirror. For example, if I raise my right hand on my right in the real world, it shows up to the right on the monitor, even though it looks like it's the left hand of the person in the monitor. So again, this wouldn't affect what your students see, but you can change that if it's just kind of confusing for you by going down to your video settings, hit the up arrow, choose video settings and uncheck mirror my video. And now this isn't going to be mirrored anymore. So you will read left to right as normal. But if you switch back to the video, for example, now when I raise my right hand, it appears on the left on my monitor. When I re lean to my right, my head moves to the left. So depending on which mode you're in, that may or may not be confusing. But again, if you don't have a touchscreen tablet available, that's an easy low-tech way to do writing. You can also use a smartphone as a document cam. Again, if you'd like to have this camera still aimed at your face and not sacrifice it for the writing, and you do have a separate um, smartphone or tablet, with a camera that you can call into Zoom with, then you can aim that at a piece of paper and use it as a document camera. I'm not gonna show that in this video, but I have one by my colleague, Dr. Matt Ford at Cornell, who explains it pretty well, and I will link that in the description.
So to wrap things up, there are a couple more advanced features I'm not going to go over in detail. I just want to highlight them in case you didn't know about them. Zoom does have a built-in polling feature, so you can use this to launch multiple choice questions. So this will give your participants a pop-up window that shows the question and answers they can select. So that is a little different than the nonverbal feedback feature, which just has yes and no. There is a breakout rooms feature, which allows you to split meeting participants up into smaller groups that are their own little individual Zoom meetings. So that's useful, for example, if you want to have small group discussions in a lecture, that way you don't have everyone talking over each other. And finally, there is also a recording feature. This may be important, especially for university classes with people in other time zones, for example, at Cornell. We are requiring that all lectures be recorded and posted to be made available for students who are either in another time zone or have a poor internet connection and couldn't attend the live lecture. And again, there's also a security setting there where you can enable or disable recording for students. So if you don't want your students to be able to record the lecture separately, you would need to turn that off. So I hope you found that useful. This is not an exhaustive overview of every single feature in Zoom. It just covers a lot of the key points that I think are important for teaching an online class and some of the things I've found have confused people as I've helped Cornell prepare for online teaching. There are a lot of official resources out there from Zoom and places like the Center for Teaching Innovation at Cornell that go into more detail on some of these things. But if you do have a question, feel free to leave a comment on YouTube and I will try to get back to you. Or if you have a request for another video or something you think would be helpful, you can let me know that as well. Thank you.